Hello and welcome to Washington Talk. I'm Eun Jung Cho. The United States warns any nuclear attack by North Korea against the United States or its allies is unacceptable and will result in the end of the North Korean regime. The U.S. also warns it will use the full range of defense capabilities, including nuclear and conventional means, to defend its allies. However, North Korea continues with its saber-rattling, violating the sea border with South Korea and firing artillery shells and short-range ballistic missiles. Join us for discussions on the security on the Korean Peninsula. All of this behavior, all of it, is reckless and deeply destabilizing to the region. We urge the DPRK to refrain, refrain from further provocations. The Korean government has ended the nuclear test of the nuclear test. 전례 없이 강력한 대응이 필요하다는 데 공감하였습니다. In the studio with me, Dr. Victor Cha, Korea Chair and Senior Vice President for Asia at the Center for Strategic and International Studies. He's a professor of government and international affairs at Georgetown University. Dr. Cha was the Director for Asian Affairs at the National Security Council, and he was also the Deputy Head of the U.S. Delegation at the Six Party Talks. Dr. Cha is currently a contributor to MSNBC and NBC News. Also with us, Mr. Scott Snyder, Director of U.S.-Korea Policy at the Council on Foreign Relations. Previously, Mr. Snyder was the Director of U.S.-Korea Policy Center at the Asia Foundation. Mr. Snyder's new edited volume reviews the first decade of North Korean foreign policy under Kim Jong-un. Welcome to the program. Thank you. Thank you. Now, Mr. Snyder. The Biden administration's nuclear posture review warns that if North Korea uses nuclear weapons against the United States or its allies or its partners, it is unacceptable and it will mean the end of the North Korean regime. It also said that there's no scenario under which the Kim regime can use nuclear weapons and survive. What do you make of this open and public warning of ending the North Korean regime? Well, I actually don't think that there's much new in that. I think that uh, previous uh, nuclear posture reviews have also included similar language uh, and it's really a function of the fact that North Korea has taken an illegal pathway toward nuclear status, and therefore the U.S. is trying to signal very clearly uh, that North Korea does not enjoy the, the benefits of the negative security assurances that the U.S. offers to non-nuclear states under the NPT. You say there's nothing new, but isn't ending the regime a lingo that is a taboo in American diplomacy, and especially given the fact that North Korea is heightening nuclear threats against South Korea and the United States at this point. Doesn't the word carry more weight at this point? Uh, you could say that there is greater urgency in that expression given the trajectory of North Korea's nuclear development. Uh, but in terms of the overall uh, threat of the consequences of nuclear use or really even of uh, North Korean provocations against South Korea. I think that we've seen long-standing uh, rhetoric uh, indicating that any ensuing conflict would be short uh, and decisive in favor of the United States. Dr. Cha, former National Security Advisor John Bolton was on Washington Talk last week and he said that in the U.S. government, there was discussions of a change in North Korean regime and that he himself was involved in those discussions. While you were in the U.S. government during the George W. Bush administration, did you ever get involved in those discussions of a possible regime change in North Korea? So he was saying that with regard to the Trump administration? Or he didn't the... specify which administration. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, 
No, I mean, the term regime change was something that was um, uh, ginned up, I think, by the, the press because the way in which it was used in U.S. policy was that uh, for there to be lasting peace on the Korean Peninsula and full denuclearization, some people thought that was only possible if the, if the regime itself, the Kim leadership, were no longer the people who were ruling North Korea. So I don't think it was so much a regime change strategy as much as it was trying to understand what would be the conditions under which you could get lasting peace on the Korean Peninsula and full denuclearization. Some people thought you could get it through negotiations, the negotiations that I was involved in uh, during the six-party talks. But some people thought that it was not possible. The negotiations could only take us so far. And to get so-called CVID, complete verifiable, irreversible denuclearization, that could only come with a change, with a change in the regime. If I could just also say on the other point um, about the NPR, um, you know, I agree with Scott. It's not nothing new. It's a, at the same time, the language is very explicit. And I think, you know, normally when we think about deterrence, we think about sort of saying, well, you know, North Korea, don't do this, or you will meet with some really unacceptable punishment. So there's some ambiguity in what the threat of retaliation would be. There's no ambiguity here, right? <laughs> Saying very clearly, if North Korea uses nuclear weapons, that's the end of the regime. And I think the purpose of that is to send as clear a deterrent signal as possible to North Korea and the world that they should have no mistake about it, that if they consider or if they actually use a nuclear weapon or a nuclear device, that that would be the end. And so I think it's meant to be a very clear statement of deterrence, uh, because that's what we're relying on right now. We're not able to stop their program. All we're relying on right now is deterrent. You know, I think the, uh, the NPR, the drafting of the NPR, you know, is a process that takes a long time that predates all this North Korean talk about tactical nuclear, nuclear weapons. Of course, they can adjust it. I mean, I think the broader reason for this very, cl very clear statement is that for the United States, they're looking this, at this in the context of what's going on in Europe and what's going on in, between China and Taiwan. And so, um, it's, so in that sense, they're very focused on deterrence right now as the answer for dealing with this North Korean problem. There's a part of either the, I think it's the NPR that also talks about opportunistic aggression, mm -hmm. right? The notion that if the United States is engaged in a contingency in Europe or in, in the Taiwan Straits, and there's opportunistic aggression by a third party, unnamed, but we know who that is. Mm -hmm. There's also a phrase in there that suggests escalation to the nuclear level for the United States. So, so I would say it's part of this broader strategy in which we are dealing with two major contingencies in Europe and in Asia. Mm -hmm. And then in addition to that, we have the North Korea issue. In this trend of escalating tensions, North Korea not only fired short-range ballistic missiles, but also intruded the northern limit line. Um, North Korea contends that United Nations Command unilaterally made this line and that um, what is U.S. government's position on the NLL as a signatory of the armistice? Well, I actually think that is correct, that the NLL has been, was unilaterally drawn, uh, but the position of the U.S., as far as I can see, is to uphold it uh, and to defend it uh, as a de facto, de facto line uh, that North Korea shouldn't cross. And generally speaking, North Korea has also either observed that or has uh, found itself at risk uh, in terms of any um, uh, vessels that may cross the NLL. Uh, and I think that what we've seen over the course of the past, um, you know, few days and weeks actually uh, is uh, an indication of a successful policy in that regard. Because even though the North Koreans have, you know, challenged the NLL by shooting some artillery, you know, in the general region of the LL, NLL, and there was a single ship that came across and then went back, uh, we see that uh, there was a successful identification of that ship uh, and that the ship did turn back. And that was, I think, 
really evidence of success uh, in deterrence at the micro level mm -hmm. in this case. Mm -hmm. Dr. Cha, Deputy Secretary Sherman met with her South Korean and Japanese counterparts in Tokyo, and they agreed to a, an unparalleled scale of response against North Korea's seventh nuclear test. What could be unparalleled scale of response? Haven't we seen so much responses so far? And have you had the chance to talk to some officials in the U.S. government about the possible response? Uh, yeah, so I saw that language too, unparalleled level of response. Um, you know, I'm not really sure what it means. I'm not privy to the sort of planning that they're doing. You know, I imagine that they would, they probably have a package of exercising and training, uh, whether it's, you know, whether it's missile defense or other sorts of things prepared um, for uh, the next North Korea nuclear, the seventh North Korea nuclear test. So. You know, I think these meetings that took place, they're good because as both Scott and I know, there's, um, there's been difficulties in the trilateral relationship in the, over the past five years. And so there's been a lot of work done on this. And this meeting and other ones like it trilaterally are for the purpose of designing what that unparalleled response would be. Like I said, I think part of it will be military, but part of it will also be diplomatic. Uh, part of it may have to do with economic sanctions. Some of it may have to do with targeting North Korean cyber activity as well, which has been financing um, the weapons program. Um, the United States government has officially stated that. Um, the, Ann Neuberger, the Deputy National Security Advisor, has stated that that's the case. So, so I think um, it'll probably be an across the spectrum in many different domain responses, um, which I think is appropriate. It's appropriate to signal that. Mr. Snyder, Bonnie Jenkins, Under Secretary of State for Arms Control and International Security, she just said, if North Korea wants a conversation, arms control talks can be an option. This is the first time that the US government talks of an arms control negotiation as a possible option. Are you surprised? And what is your idea about having an arms control negotiation with North Korea? Well, I do think that language is a little bit striking, and I would want to know a little bit more about the context uh, in which she made that statement. Uh, and I would also want to um, just uh, understand uh, whether or not uh, that means any change in the U.S. position on denuclearization. I think it is not. Uh, but uh, that kind of statement uh, as a standalone does raise that question. And so the issue, I think, is really arms control. Well, I mean, the fact of the matter is that uh, it's inevitable uh, that as you talk about uh, developing a process of uh, negotiated denuclearization, that arms control could be a significant component of that. Uh, but the most important thing in the bottom line, I think, for the US government is that uh, there's not going to be, in my view, uh, any abandonment of the objective of denuclearization on the part of the US government. So Mr. Snyder just said arms control is inevitable in the process of denuclearization negotiations, and there are calls in Washington that this could be an interim goal, the arms control and nuclear freeze. But isn't there also a chance that this could be a perpetual state that North Korea possesses its nuclear weapons capped? So first, I think um, Bonnie Jenkins' statement, I mean, you know, she's from a bureau in the State Department. Their job is to negotiate arms control. That's like, that's what they do. So, um, so I don't know if the statement was taken out of context. I don't know if it was couched in an overarching uh, explicit ex elucidation of the goal, which is uh, still irreversible denuclearization. And that arms control, as Scott said, could be part of the process leading to that. Uh, for what it's worth, I can't remember which it is, the NDS, the, the, the documents that were released, the NDS, mm -hmm. the NPR, the MDR, one of them says very clearly the U.S. goal remains denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula. So I don't think it's, I don't, would not take her statements as sort of edging away mm -hmm. from, um, from, the, from that objective. Uh, look, I think, I, you know, I think Scott's right. It, it's, you can talk about denuclearization as the goal and engage in negotiations that, um, uh, that are about threat reduction and arms control. Mm -hmm. Um, it, that, that can take a long time, you know, as we've seen, whether it was the agreed framework in 94, the six party talks, the implementation of these agreements and the ongoing negotiations to get to the next phase take years, right? Mm -hmm. And that could certainly be the case if we were ever to get into another negotiation uh, with North Korea. So I think that is, um, you know, that is just part of the process. 
there's not going to be a Libya solution for North Korea. I think everybody understands, even your prior guest, John Bolton, <laughs> understands that that's not going to be likely given the state of North Korea's nuclear program today. So, you know, I would say that this goal of denuclearization and the notion of a hard fought negotiation over capping fissile material, nuclear test ban, you know, reducing the, their missile arsenal, these may all look like arms control, and people can call it what they want, but the idea is to reduce the threat from North Korea. But, you know, there is a clandestine nuclear facility, Gangsong, in North Korea, and there are second and third such facilities. North Korea can hide its nuclear facilities. How can we verify North Korean keeping its nuclear freeze agreements and promises? Well, it's the same problem we've always had with North Korea, right? And the fact that, you know, you, you call Kong Sun a clandestine facility. It's not that clandestine if you're able to talk about it on the news, um, on, on Washington talk. Um, so, um, so, yeah, so I think that there is always going to be a, a problem with verification with North Korea. In the end, the previous agreements, as we both know, um, they really sort of came to a halt when we got to the point of uh, nuclear declaration and then trying to verify that nuclear de declaration, that's where the, the talks ended up stopping. Mm -hmm. That's where the agreements kind of fell apart. And that will be the challenge going forward as well. Mm -hmm. um, Mr. Snyder, Deputy Secretary Sherman said that we will use the full range of U.S. deterrence capabilities to defend our allies, including nuclear, conventional, and missile defense capabilities. This line is repeated repeatedly over by U.S. officials. Um, I saw an argument saying that because United States never um, adopted a no first use policy, that Washington is actually saying that it can use nuclear weapons first to defend its allies. Is this the right interpretation? I actually would probably default to a different interpretation because we know that uh, in the context of internal discussions on the nuclear posture review, that there were debates over the question of whether the uh, administration should uh, publicly state a no first use or a sole purpose policy. Uh, and that did not happen. Uh, and generally speaking, I think in terms of the US response, when uh, Deputy Secretary Sherman says something like that, what she's saying is that we have a vast array of capabilities that can be brought to bear uh, in response to uh, any sort of aggression involving nuclear weapons, uh, and that that response could include uh, nuclear use, but it could also include a lot of other uh, means uh, that we would deem to be as effective as nuclear in terms of responding to that uh, circumstance. Dr. Cha, in South Korea, there's growing calls, especially in the ruling party, to ha bring in U.S. tactical nuclear weapons to South Korea. How is the redeployment of U.S. tactical weapons to South Korea not the best option for the U.S. government? Um, so I think, so there, there are two, this can be answered in two ways. The first is, the, you know, the question is, if you bring tactical nuclear weapons back to the Korean Peninsula, does that mil militarily change or improve the situation for the United States and South Korea, right? That's the first question. And there, I think most military experts and, op experts and operators will tell you, no, it doesn't that it doesn't have a value added on the military side. So then that then defaults to the second argument, which is it's important for political reassurance, right? Extended deterrence is about capabilities, but it's also about reassurance, political reassurance. And would it provide some sort of political reassurance? The answer probably there is yes. It would provide more political reassurance to the South Korean government, to the South Korean public. But then what would be the cost if you would, were to do something like that? For one, I think um, the Biden administration is not really interested in increasing um, the number of nuclear weapons in the world. They're, you know, they, you know we, this goes back to the Obama speech on nuclear zero, so I don't think that ideologically that's something that they want to do. Um, and I think that they feel that the, there aren't real benefits to doing that, whereas the cost could be higher in terms of escalating the situation on the peninsula. We've had this discussion for weeks now, and I've hear so many people saying that if we have tactical US nuclear weapons in South Korea, it would escalate tensions and it would even make North Korea attack South Korea more. But that, does that mean like countries like France or UK, they're more vulnerable because they have nuclear weapons on their soil, they're more vulnerable to a nuclear attack from another nuclear weapon state? Well, I mean, the thing, again, the, the, this question is framed as, well, South Korea doesn't have 
South Korea is a non-nuclear state, and therefore they may be more vulnerable to attack by North Korea. South Korea is a non-nuclear state, but they have a nuclear umbrella. They have a nuclear security guarantee. They have the full weight of the U.S. nuclear forces behind them. So it's not like they're, it's not like they are, they are not Ukraine, right? In the sense that Ukraine didn't, you know, it was not a NATO ally. Uh, it didn't have a nuclear umbrella over it. You know, in the case of South Korea and Japan, it's a completely different situation. They are military allies of the United States. They have U.S. forces on the ground in case there were ever any hostilities on the peninsula automatically engaging the United States, and they have the full weight of the U.S. Uh, nuclear umbrella. And the statements in the NPR, the, uh, the NDS, and the, uh, and the MDR would state very clearly use of a nuclear weapon by North Korea would mean the end of the regime, as well as, the, as Scott said, the no first use doctrine. Uh, they're not being a no first use doctrine. The U.S. reserves the right to use nuclear weapons first in the case potentially of opportunistic aggression or some other sort of scenario that threatened South Korea and Japan. Mr. Snyder, on this political reassurance about this extended deterrence, is there a possibility that if we have a change in the U.S. administration, the extended deterrence pledge could be weakened or could be overturned? There could be calls from the U.S. side to, for South Korea to increase the burden sharing or we could withdraw the extended deterrence. Well, I think there's two aspects to that question. One is that there is a legal framework uh, related to the Mutual Defense Treaty. But if we really dig into that, either side can pull out of the treaty with only one year uh, notice. Uh, and so that, in this context, actually looks pretty weak. Uh, and then there's the issue of political assurance. Uh, and that is really about uh, credibility and trust uh, between allies. Uh, and whether or not there could be uh, an anti-traditionalist who comes into office uh, and withdraws that pledge. And I think that uh, that has emerged as a, a valid concern uh, that uh, could uh, emerge. Uh, and it's something that actually right now, we're, when we're in relatively good shape, we should have uh, deeper discussions and deeper coordination to deal with both of those tracks. I want to close with this question. When you were on our program last time, Mr. Snyder, you said alliance and nuclear acquisition is no longer a contradictory concept different from situation decades ago. Are you saying that U.S. will accept Korea developing its own nuclear weapons? No, that's actually not. I was really trying to address the issue of whether or not uh, the U.S. could live with a nuclear South Korea mm -hmm. uh, and, I, and, and maintain an alliance relationship. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I believe that, uh, at least as a hypothetical, uh, that is a more, um, more possible uh, outcome uh, than has been the case for decades. Dr. Cha, what are your thoughts? Can the United States live with nuclear South Korea different from what happened in the early 1970s that we all know from the declassified documents that U.S. was against South Korea's nuclear development? Uh, yeah, that's a difficult question to answer. <laughs> Um, uh, you know, obviously it would depend on the contingency, it would depend on who is the president at the time. You know, if, it's, if it were Donald Trump, he would probably say yes, like, because he already said, like, the whole region should go nuclear. I mean, so if it were Donald Trump, he might say yes. I mean, if it were a, another U.S. administration, a Biden administration, or another administration besides Donald Trump, uh, I think it would be something, I think it would be a very, it would be a pivotal point in the relationship. Because, uh, you know, the, the alliance relationship is about the U.S. security guarantee to South Korea. And if South Korea develops nuclear weapons because they are not comfortable with um, the credibility of the U.S. defense commitment, it does call into question the whole purpose of the alliance, right? You know, why is the alliance there? Why do we have 27,500 troops there? If, the, if our ally doesn't believe that we'll defend them. So um, I, I honestly don't know the answer to that question. I think it really depends on the situation and who's the president in the United States. Uh, but it would, be a, it would be a pivotal moment in, in the alliance relationship. We will continue our discussion next time. Dr. Cha, Mr. Snyder, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. That's all for us today. Have a great week, and we'll see you back here next week with U.S. experts to discuss the two Koreas and the region right here from Washington.